Uh, Mike Lynch, I'm the founder of Invoke Capital and before that Autonomy and uh, a number of other tech businesses. Well I was originally an academic uh, working in the engineering department here at Cambridge and uh, I had no knowledge of business or business background and we made some sort of breakthroughs in getting computers to understand what things actually meant and uh, rather naively I sort of thought oh you might be able to make a business out of that and luckily I didn't know any of the problems and so started and um, uh, basically ran it initially out of a Christ College graduate uh, flat which I'm told still has solder in the carpet from where we have to have to make things and um, basically learnt on the job pretty quickly. Uh, it was an evolutionary process because uh, we got £2,000 to get going and if we hadn't managed to do something with that then uh, I guess I'd have gone back to the day job. If we go back to the early days what happened was that we um, we were lucky to be working in an area where the value to the customer was not related to the cost. So, for example, one of the very first things we ever designed was fingerprint matching machines. Now, in those days, uh, to search fingerprint, you'd have 30 people doing it for three weeks. We produced a machine that could do it in three minutes. The value to the police of that bore no relation to the cost of production, so the gross margin was massive. And it was actually that that funded the business. Um, and we're very lucky to have an amazingly high gross margin business. And actually, organically, the business got to a turnover of about 4 million with a 50% operating margin, which is a figure I never managed to repeat after that. Um, but, uh, you know, it meant that we were, we were actually self-funding uh, along the way. And um, business grew very rapidly. Uh, we took in a little bit of venture funding. Um, and uh, we actually got to the point where we were able to IPO actually onto ESDAC, which was the attempt to create a European NASDAQ in those days. Couldn't list on London because the rules were they had to have three years of profitable trading, uh, which has changed now. But uh, we went to ESDAC and uh, nothing happened. Um, so this is pre-internet bubble. And I remember we um, sort of uh, just went sideways. I think the share price was around 30p and sort of, ticks down to 25 or something like that um, uh, and we carried on growing the business and it uh, was profitable and grew very rapidly uh, and then uh, everything started to heat up in the technology world and um, the company became suddenly very valuable um, we listed on to Nasdaq and then by then London sorted out its act and we listed on to London and then of course we had the other side of that which is the, the sudden massive rise in value I becomes a massive crash in value, so I, I think off the top of my head we went from 30p to something like 128 oh, pounds to 80p. Um, the difference was that it was a real business, with, unlike all the other companies that came and went in that period. And uh, then it was a very interesting period of you know just having to have your head down and carry on building the profits and the growth and the business grew from there. Well, it's actually, in one way, it, there's a, a lesson here, which is in the technology world, um, no one knows the answer. Derek Smith doesn't know the answer, I don't know the answer, no one knows the answer. So what it is about is being able to adapt very quickly as information comes in. And one of the big advantages of not having a business background is it becomes very difficult if you would have a very formal business background to understand what is something which is deriving naturally from a situation and what is a sort of patterning or process that is sort of accepted wisdom but ne not necessarily built on the situation. And um, so on the one hand I had a massive disadvantage of not knowing all the things I should have known. On the other hand you were going back to first principles all the time which is actually a very, very clever way of doing things and the world is changing very fast. So a lot of it was just saying well why do we do this? What's the advantage of doing that? Why would we do that? Why, why is that the way it's done? Um, and uh, luckily in the technology world, that agility is very valuable and makes up for some of the uh, other mistakes you might make. Do you, do you think your knowledge of pattern recognition has, has helped you lead and build the company at all? Uh, to be honest, like, so pattern recognition is very close to decision theory in, in, uh, in, in the mathematics. And it really undermines a lot of the business uh, stuff that you read. Um, you know, the, the way in which we articulate using words, how, how we make decisions, is complete illusion. We, it's very easy to show that we don't make decisions the way we say we do, and we don't follow the processes that we say we do when we're asked to articulate it. So um, 
you know, it's yes, it is a it's a very liberating thing to be able to realise that actually, um, I'd rather make decisions the way my dog does than what you read in a business book. And I'm not in any way putting dogs down. You know, uh, uh, when a dog goes about its business, it makes incredibly complex decisions on probabilistic information, and it gets them right a lot of the time. Yeah, and uh, that's actually how really good leaders do it as well. Yeah. It's just that when you ask them how they do it, they don't have to come up with uh, some sort of you know, set of words and rules that bear no relation to what they do. There's some very nice experiments that prove that as well, by the way. Mm, right. we, have, we actually <laughs> teach a lot of these. And we talk with there's some very good articles on espoused theory and theory in use. Mm -hmm. and, um, you're absolutely right. What I love is, is um, there was a problem with spotting tanks in um, open, in sort of, you know, Salisbury Plain. And it turned out there were two uh, chaps who were just incredibly better at this than everyone else. You could sort of put them down and they'd say, there's a tank there, 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 and no one else could see them. And so they did a big study on them, and uh, they, uh, they asked them how they did it, and they came up with a whole report. And then some bright spark uh, on the last few days got hold of these glasses that can tell where you're looking. And it turned out that what they actually did bore no relation to what the report said because they didn't know what they did. <laughs> they just did it. And it worked. And um, that's the, the lesson about decision-making sometimes. Yeah, so to, to manage very rapid growth, you have to create a culture that is all about that. Um, that has to be inherent in everything that's going on. I'll give you a very simple example of my experience in that we um, created an automatic number plate reader. And uh, we did this in about six months and it cost us probably about £100,000. And we sent it, we sold it to Raykel. And Raykel Research took it away and eventually I rang the head of the company and said, I haven't had any royalty checks, what's happening? He said, I don't know, Mike, we'll go down and find out. We went down to Raykel's lab and there was a room full of people. And uh, they spent a million pounds on it and they spent a year. And we took the original prototype, which was held together by sellotape, and their one, and the old one won in a test. And the reason was that they had a culture which had decided that it was going to be driven by Gantt charts on the wall and process, and they estimated how long everything was going to take. And there was no way, when you do that, it will happen faster than that chart. It may well happen slower than the chart. And so culturally, the whole thing was not geared to being responsive and high growth. Um, the, the whole process had fallen away from where it was going. I think the other thing that's important about that is you need to create an organisation for high growth which is self-healing. And what I mean by that is anything that gets in the way of that growth, it takes care of itself. It's not something which is directly sort of Stalinless sort of management from above. It's much more like the, the situation, you know, of a, uh, there's a group of people, they see something wrong. Well, that's just not going to stay there um, in that kind of high growth culture. So, um, And then a mission. You know, we're not in this, and this is a great technology one, we're not in this to make a company, we're in this to change the world. Any, any big mistakes that you regret about, or tell me while, whilst you were running it? Oh, there's a, you know, there's a long, long list. You know, the other important management thing to realise is that it's a bit like the hedge fund industry, and you only have to get it right 51% of the time, <laughs> not 100% of the time. And actually, if you try to get it right 100% of the time, you'll fail. So, um, you know, you've got to take those risks and get things wrong. No, I, I have a whole series of great ones. Um, you know, we had a Google-like search engine, and then I read a load of reports about how advertising on the internet was dead, and we pulled the plug on it. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them have been the classics that you always hear people say, you know, where I knew someone was wrong and I didn't act on it quick enough, um, which is a very common one you hear about. Um, the other great one is just, you know, financial engineering. When autonomy was worth, during the dot-com boom, £6 billion, I should have gone and bought every biscuit factory in the world. <laughs> and then I'd have come out of the dot-com crash uh, with, uh, uh, with £6 billion worth of biscuit uh, manufacturing, so you know, there's there's a lot of these things that you uh, you can look back on, but uh, you know, as long as it's fifty one percent of the time, that's fine. How do you deal with, um, I suppose, the aftermath of the the autonomy sale with the you know the eight point eight? I think it's now eight point eight billion write down, and you know all the f accusations of you know accounting malfeasance and fraud and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it just seems very very difficult to deal with personally. I, I, 
Well, what, what happens, you know, is that you have autonomy, uh, you know, an amazing bunch of people create an amazing business, and then, you know, under UK law, you have no control. Someone comes along, makes an offer, it gets sold. And, you know, the day that you go public is the day that you lose any control or stop in that situation. And, you know, when uh, we went into HP and it had one of its, um, you know, regular management bust-ups and the people who wanted to do the transaction were thrown out and the, their arch enemies were in power and all this sort of stuff, you know, it's a very bizarre situation because you're used to a culture which is all about achieving and growth and... That's a culture which is all about stabbing each other in the back and trying to, you know, they're much more interested in putting a banana skin under another division than actually beating the competition. So it's a real shock. And we managed to hold uh, autonomy together for about six months. And then one day, the first sort of senior person said, I just can't take it anymore, I can't go in, and they left. And the problem was that was like the dam breaking. And... Uh, you know, so those people left. Now, at the time, you feel very sad about that. But then what you actually see is what's happened now, which is I'm now working with about 50 of those people. We're all back together. All the old people work together with all the management team. We're doing fun, amazing things. The people who aren't with us have gone off and started other companies. So one of the great ironies is it may turn out to be a great thing for uh, the UK tech scene, because now you've got people who are incredibly experienced, trained, and actually with reasonable amounts of money off doing technology in the UK. So, you know, maybe a technology is a problem, but you always tend to look forward into looking at what these people are doing. Some of the things they're doing are amazing as well. Um, and uh, unleashing a lot of the power from people sitting in the engineering department now doing their PhD. So, that's the way you look at it. And of course, you know, the nice thing about technology um, is you can go out there, be innovative and win by innovation. The one thing I would say is I am convinced that we are um, entering another golden age of tech. Um, the more you look at what's coming together, so things like processor power doubling in smartphones every six, eight months, always on connectivity, the software being able to extract meaning from things, um, you know, sequencing of genes and tumours and personal medicine. We, I think it starts to make the internet up to now look like a sort of um, overture. And you know, what that's going to lead to is both great creation and great destruction. And, uh, you know, when you're in technology, the thing you love is volatility. Um, you obviously hope you're on the right side of it. But, you know, what you don't want is, you know, steady, stable, uh, monolithic industries out there. You can't do much from that.